ordinary section in this room. And as some of you may have noticed, uh, this um, talk really belongs to the uh, economy, but we also hope it can uh, help out with the revolution in some ways. So we're going to talk about the EU uh, basic income initiative. We have uh, nothing newer than uh, the left. Thank you, Sia. Uh, thanks for having us here at the response. Uh, so my name is Martin Jordo. I'm a native here of Göteborg. Uh, I hope you all can hear me up there as well. Fine. Uh, actually, it's been studying here, sitting here uh, so many hours. It feels nice to be back. Thank you. My name is uh, Oli Berkos. I'm very glad to be with you here today, everyone. And uh, nice to see some uh, friendly faces in the audience. Uh, not that uh, faces that have no friends, not my friends, but Anyway, I always come here from Gothenburg. I've been running my own uh, business as a facilitator since uh, 2008, and last one and a half years I've been uh, working mainly as an artist. And uh, I do, uh, I've always uh, made sure that I have a lot of spare time in my life to, in, uh, to do the things that I love. And, uh, and one, of, one of the things that I recently stumbled upon that uh, I've been very, very fascinated about and I see a lot of potential in is the universal basic care. Yeah. So let's start with that. That's what we're going to talk about. Unconditional basic income. A quick show of hands. Do you know what this is about? Feel you do? You raise your hand. That's more than half of the audience, at least. But that's good. We're in a, we're in a friendly crowd. Uh, I'm going to start off with a small story about this woman. Uh, she's called Mel Harper Lee. And this picture was taken, I think, in the 50s. She was a single working girl in New York City, working for an airline company. And in her spare time, she was writing short stories. And she was actually quite good at that. And some of her friends noticed, it, noticed that. So in the Christmas of 1956, she was given a parcel by her friends that said, quit your job, here's your salary for the next year, please go right. And what Mel Hopperly did was to write a quite famous book, To Kill a Mockingbird, which won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction and has been voted again and again for one of the top 100 books of the, uh, of the 19th century. And just a little question to you here is what would happen to your life if someone offered you the gift that was given to you on the If you were free of constraints of having to worry about your income, be able to work on whatever you like, what would you do? And that's what we are here to talk about, really. But we're going to go through some of the basics first, so then we'll come back to the creative side. Uh, I'm going to show you this short video uh, because this is the camp campaign bill of uh, the European Union Citizens Initiative, which I'm the Swedish representative of. And uh, well, the film will let us speak for today. Austerity seems to be the only answer given to remedy the economic crisis in Europe. Yet people are getting poorer and poorer. Automation in manufacturing and wealth accumulation by financial institutions are changing our approach to work. More and more is produced with fewer and fewer people. Unemployment rates have skyrocketed and pay work is no longer a right for everyone. The good news is that never before in history have human societies generated so much wealth. But while this wealth is produced by the work of all, past and present, this wealth is unevenly distributed among citizens. We as European citizens propose an alternative. It's not a new idea, but now is the time to put it into action. It's called unconditional basic income. Have you heard of it? Not yet. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, 
and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment and sickness. There it is. Basic income should be universal, individual, unconditional, and high enough to ensure a dignified existence and participation in society. This new fundamental right for humanity not only would eradicate misery, it is also a way to develop non-market oriented work, such as artists, parents, and volunteers. But it's also an economic measure. A basic income for all means supporting local business. Therefore, it would enable us to fully exercise our citizenship. How do we finance it? Easy. We have several proposals. Financial and high income taxation, a consumption tax on luxury goods and polluting products, and mainly self-financing by simplification of a very long list of current social transfers and associated public services, which have become obsolete. What we propose would be much simpler, equal, and transparent. Everyone gets a basic income without even asking for it. But then, of course, it's up to you to work if you want more money. We as European citizens have now launched an official petition called the European Citizen Initiative to make the European authorities examine our manifesto. So, what's the deal? First of all, we have to surpass a minimum threshold of seven countries minimum. Fifteen countries have already joined the campaign and are getting ready to collect signatures. Hopefully others will join up soon. The European Commission must consider our proposals when we reach the one million signatures required. If accepted, studies of the different models and amounts of basic income will begin. We must mobilize by organizing events, creating local groups, and creating a buzz by telling your friends and everyone around you that a new idea is growing in Europe. Thank you for visiting basicincome2013.eu and signing our petition. And thank you for watching our campaign films. <laughs> well, you were forced to, weren't you? <laughs> so, what's the deal here? Uh, this is about forcing the European Union to consider this on a European level or to uh, examine to make studies and pilot projects for basic income. And uh, getting one million signatures is quite, uh, quite an obstacle, especially if you have to use your uh, computer systems for gathering them. Uh, <laughs> they're not really that interested in the citizens uh, collecting that signatures. But it can be done. And we're mainly here today because what we noticed is that out in Europe, in Croatia, in Germany, in France, some of the leading advocates and some of the people that get best results for this are people involved in uh, new technology, free software, the pirate movement, and they come together to uh, want to examine the economic fundamentals of society. I'll do a short recap and I'll hand over to you, boy. The screen is double, that's why. Basic income to be interesting, I think. 
And uh, one of the reasons is our uh, common view of our of our wealth that we have together. This is the uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, already. It's from Optum Blooded to our United Mines to see how much uh, how much private wealth do we have in Sweden. This is from 2007, and this is uh, how much is this? It's, it's five uh, five thousand five hundred billion uh, francs. That's the amount of money that we have. Together, and that is the whole system here. Stop working. Uh, okay, I, I will. I will work manually. And uh, this, this is how we uh, we think. They ask a thousand persons around in Sweden. This is how we think this wealth is distributed. The poorest twenty percent down in the left, and the richest uh, twenty percent to the right, and and three blocks in the middle that are equal twenty percent. Each. And this is how we think it should be uh, distributed, our common wealth in the society in Sweden today. And so you can see there's a, there's some difference, and it's not, not a very big difference. But the interesting, uh, the, the interesting part is to see how it's actually distributed. This is, uh, this is, there's quite a discrepancy here between what we, what we, we, we think we have, what we Think we should have and what we actually have, uh, and, and, and somehow we work. just happen to miss this somewhere along how we design uh, our society. <coughs> so, uh, moving on, we can see here that they said the one percent, uh, the one, the richest percent in Sweden owns about 23 percent of the complete the total wealth, economic wealth uh, in Sweden. We can look at it from uh, a uh, horizontal uh, point of view also. And the introspect is, uh, yeah, this, this is how we think that, uh, that the money is distributed. This is how we think it should be distributed. And this is how it is distributed. You can see here on the, uh, on the bottom left, these are the poorest. They don't have any, any money at all. They only have debts. This is sweet. Uh, more so what can we say in a, in a, in a less equal country the, the curve will be steeper? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. The curve will be very much steeper in most most other countries. So yeah, there, there's a one percent to own support for the whole economy. Um, <coughs> let me just so um, what I see is the basic. Uh, the basic income system would be one way to even out these numbers a little bit more to what we actually want to have rather than the situation that we have found ourselves in uh, right now. It won't solve all the, uh, all the problems of the world, but it's, it's, it, it, would be, it, it has the potential to at, at least be one little puzzle piece in, in this thing that, that we need to solve. So, uh, and I want to Look at it from another perspective as well. Yeah. Um, Bronnie Ware, this is not Bronnie Ware, this is just some random statue. Um, but Bronnie Ware, he was, she's an Australian nurse. She spent several years working in uh, palliative care, caring for patients in their last uh, 12 weeks of their lives. She recorded their dying epiphanies in a blog called Inspiration and Chai, uh, which gathered so much attention that she put the observations in a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Where writes uh, of the phenomenal clarity of vision that people gain at the end of their lives and how we might learn from their wisdom. When questioned about any regrets they had or anything they could do differently, she says, Common themes surfaced again and again. So, so I want to show you the. These are the, um, uh, the top five regrets of the dying. If you could just read that. It's okay to be a little bit rude. So 
uh, yeah, I want to focus on these two parts. This, there's something uh, for me. There's something very disturbing in this uh, uh, in, in this uh, image, and all, and very very moving to just look and see see that okay, should I how should I cope with this information uh, I'm getting? Um, because I think we've all been there. We all know a lot of lots of people. You know, many many of our friends who are there right now. Just our time doesn't add up. Uh, we spend so much time working all of the time, and after working comes taking care of the family, if they have a family, and so on. There's so little time left to spend with with friends or with the project that you do just because you love to do them. And I don't think that the, the, like the individual cannot be blamed for this. This is the society that we have created, and uh, together with our ancestors, of course, that has put us in this situation. And today, we have this. Uh, uh, there is there are lots of problems in society. One of them is unemployment. It's a, it's a huge problem. Um, and, and, and the government seems to think today that everyone that's not on their deathbed or dead already should be working with any kind of job at any cost at all. It's the Arbets linear, the, the workfare, Martin told me that it's, the name is in English, it's, I, I'm not sure that it's very known, but Arbets linear, it's, it's the, um, more, more, almost all of the political parties back this up, and it's, it is the Argus is made to create jobs so that no one needs to be unemployed. But it's almost turned out the other way. It's like you have to be employed. Or else you're not following the, the state religion, or you're not doing your duty as, a, as being a worker. And, and this, um, and it's almost like that you are a sinner and you should be punished if you don't have a job. And of course, creating more uh, jobs can be a very good uh, thing. It can be a really awesome thing to do. But I'm questioning this. Is it, is it, is it that today? Is it so good to do that today? Like, what, what are we? What are we creating all these jobs for? What are we working for? Why should we spend all this time working? Like, what is the huge common project that we have as a people or as a nation state that we are, that's the purpose of, 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 uh, of all the work we do? Um, is, it, is, it for, is it for this that we're working? It's, uh, I don't know, it's, it seems uh, skewed. Maybe there is something else to work for. Would you like to uh, continue? Yeah, sure. I'm actually uh, going to stop for a little while and just tell you again why we're here. Because we're going to leave you uh, with a mission. We're here to engage you because we believe that we have a very small window right now with this European Union initiative. That runs until the 14th of January uh, next year. And we can collect these one million signatures, we will make this fringe issue a really hot potato on the political scene. And we've seen it happen in other countries in Europe, and we believe that you are some of the people that help us spread this message and get it across. So pay attention now to why we need this. I will recap. We're still in our welfare society with enormous wealth where we have generated an increase in our uh, gross domestic product every year for a century. We still have extreme poverty. Not to mention the other, uh, other under underdeveloped countries. Uh, and the problem is... Uh, and instead of going in the right direction, we actually see, for the last decades, uh, rising social inequality between classes. Which doesn't have to be. This is, many people 
phi and give up and think economics or society or capitalism for that matter is something that just happens and something that is a, uh, a law of nature are doing you to think otherwise. And what we see is, I don't know if you heard the term precariat. Have you? Have you want to have something? Oh, that's not working very, very well done. Some hands, that's good. But what we see is, these are fast food workers at McDonald's working on minimum wage in, in the US, striking for a living wage because they work a normal 40 hours a week job and they can't make enough money to feed their family. Because minimum wage in, in the States is too low for that, so they need a second job. And we're getting a working class, it's not only that people are unemployed, we're getting a working class here in Europe as well that will have a hard time surviving. And we have a growing class. Most of my friends under 30 don't know the term um, steady employment. They have, they work for, on projects. They work for a couple, for hours. Maybe they have a company and they try to build on that company, but they, they're insecure and they're not covered by the existing welfare system, not in a good way. And this is happening as well. It's been going on for a long time. This is uh, manufacturing, and uh, we can automate a lot of work, remove workers, and increase profitability. That's a good thing. I think we should do this. But uh, it leaves people unemployed. Not all people, because someone has to make the robots, someone has to design the software, and so on. What will probably going to be happening in the next decades is a whole slew of new jobs will be optimized that we thought was secure. Your people going, uh, going here to study to be lawyers, for example. Will lawyers really be around in 20 or 30 years? Will that occupation even exist with the advances in artificial intelligence and uh, computer systems. Doctors, the drivers of trucks, is that uh, there's millions and millions of people and where one of our uh, things here is that the, this development is going faster and faster and we will not be able to cope with rearranging society as we have done before. And can you do the next slide? Yes. So, Yen Li from Tegen, great. Free us from work. This is kind of the opposite message of the Arbeits uh, Linie, uh, the, the, the political policy where we're supposed to work as much as possible, always. This is the opposite of that. It's, um, it's a vision where we're in, instead aiming to be free. Um, This, this quote, I'll, I'll translate it, in. it says, the goal of, of societal development, uh, mm -hmm. if the goal of societal development would be that we should all work maximally, we would be insane. The goal is to free man so that he can, he, she can create maximally. Dancing, painting, singing, yeah, whatever you want, freedom. This is from uh, Ernst V. Bush who was the Minister of Finance in Sweden in uh, 1937. <coughs> we sort of forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, nothing happened. Yeah, there he is, here And, uh, uh, yeah, he's all dead and buried now. But uh, his uh, idea is uh, hopefully alive and, and growing today with us here. Uh, this fantastic uh, banner is from a uh, demonstration in, I think it was in Mount Mary, uh, uh, earlier this, uh, this year, uh, where they were uh, people were organizing for the Fritz Linie, the free time uh, policy, say, the opposite of the working policy. And so, 
Yeah, so these are kind of two different roles that we can we can uh, we can actually decide what kind of society we, we want to have. Is it a society where we want to work as much as possible, or a society where, there, where we want to be as free as possible? And I would like you to just take a minute to think about. Uh, what a basic income would change the way that you live your life? What would your, what would a day be like for you? Uh, what would a year be like for you? How would it feel different if you had uh, a guarantee that you would get every month enough money to to pay your rent, to pay for food, for clothes, and your phone? Maybe some more. Take one minute and think about that, all right? Jag tror att det kan finnas ett samstal i en ekonomisk kris i EU. Det är en stor ekonomisk kris i EU. Ja, inte än. Nej, men den är på uppgången. Ja, ja, så ska man presentera detta. Så är det nu man ska göra det. Så jag ska prova det i Tyskland. Nej, just det. Skulle du vilja dela dina tankar? programs that no one would be willing to pay for, but they should be written. They ought to be written. Anyone else? <coughs> Is it okay to say that people would be laying around your couch? If that's the truth. Yeah. Well, I, I just told them that I actually really don't know, and that's probably why I'm still working and just saving money. And <laughs> when I, one day I find out this awesome project, and it do, I just went off and did on my savings. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes? Okay. I think it depends when you have a means to live on your savings, it depends on you what you want to do, actually. Of course, you can be on this couch doing nothing, watch TV, hang out with your friends or whatever, or maybe you're politically involved, or maybe you want to do artwork, or Maybe you want to be a journalist, or maybe you want to study, who knows, you know? It's, uh, or maybe you want to travel around the world, who, who actually knows? But uh, it's different people will have different resources to, to use, I guess. So it's very individual, what, but I think when it's accepted in society, it will be a little bit different than today, because today you're... Well, if you would go and use your social welfare to travel around the world, I guess people would get pissed. Well, it, it wouldn't work, but that's the, the mentality. So it's also, you have to think about these aspects, and it has to be uh, accepted. And that's the point. Okay. We will talk for one more. And I think you... Oh, yes. Uh, of course, it's interesting from the age perspective, where you are at the moment. And uh, I think we are so conditioned, and also, to take part in the society. So my age group uh, are willing to accept the work and if we are fit for it until 80, <laughs> 90. And um, uh, the magazines and newspapers are full of people kind of going on the 80-year-old truck driver and things like that, and people fight to stay in their jobs. And of course, because that generation, this is part of the difficulty to, to, to get um, your initiative. 
which of course I, I uh, think is great, but I have been, um, of course, seeing this change because in the 60s and 70s, it was a more even distribution of incomes in the Scandinavian countries. So this growing division between the people that don't. And of course they have been supported by the state and by the governments and with the social uh, democratic uh, government that have made it possible to allocate wealth uh, with um, different well, political decisions. And I think that's true for Europe as well, most of the European countries. So, Let's hope for much. your initiative. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, some small things tomorrow. Yeah. Can you can hear it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we're going to get to just a quick uh, run through of uh, how to do this and the arguments against it as well. So you get both sides. It was mentioned in the film uh, some of the revenue sources you can use to finance basic income. Because what I get all the time, I'm, I'm working, I'm trying to spread this idea, is that, oh, that sounds fine. I'll be happy to work it a little bit less. Of course, I want people to have freedom in society. Yeah, that's fine. But that won't work. There's no money. That's going to be always probably cost trillions. We can't do that. But the thing is, when you dig in deeper and look at the numbers, the money is there. There are plenty of money in the system. It's more of a priorities issue on how to distribute them and what to do with the money. What we have today is something I like to call guaranteed income, social security systems, especially here in the Nordic countries, that are quite generous on a, on a worldwide scale. You're sort of you're not starving in the streets anyway, but they are terribly bureaucratic and very the state always has an incentive to keep people out of them. They cost them money and they try to make people not claim social benefits or unemployment benefits or even sickness benefits. Uh, so there's, there's lots of money in that that you could take and get together and put in one basket to dispute like if Sweden had a child allowance that is a basic income for, for children. That. Of course, you can save money in the state and on different welfare programs when people actually have a basic income. So everyone uh, has a, a base to stand on. And there's also the uh, possibilities of getting new money into the state system because what this is is taking some of the responsibility from the market to provide for everyone and put it in the hands of the common, of the state. Because right now, if you, if you think about it, the market, the market economy, it's not really interested in that everyone is provided for. That's not an economic law. That's what the market is interested in is a stable buying power that goods will be consumed and services. But the state, we, the people, are interested in everyone to life, everyone that we know needs met. Uh, so you get these things. Some of you are thinking in writing. I don't know if we're dirty though. We might be called it. So, <laughs> and uh, you will get this a lot as well when you talk about this to people that haven't heard about it yet people that have heard about the AID and think, oh, um, yeah, there was a mention about that 15 years ago, and that, that was the communist, so I'm pretty sure this is fucked up. Uh, okay, will people stop working? Yes, some people will, and that's something we can handle. But mostly, we will give people the freedom to choose a bit more how much they want to work. And the question is, that's why we ask this, what would you do? And we've got different answers. Because people tend to think more negatively about society as a large. 
So a common response is, well, I would probably work, because I like my work. I would work maybe 30 hours a week instead of 40 hours. Yeah, but, but all the rest of it is going to stay, stay at home and play video games. And uh, well, that's really that would be the case. That it's morally or ethically wrong to get money. Why should you get something for nothing? And this is probably over the, the key issue, I think. This is something that we have to change the mindset on. Did you know that you profit from someone else's work every day? Every time you look up an article on Wikipedia, you're profiting from someone else's work. Is that unjust? Not really. We're all standing on the shoulders of our forebears that have built this wealth that we are currently enjoying. It's not me working in the factory that is creating all the wealth. It is the society around me and the people before me. So no, it's not, it is not unjust to profit from, from society a lot and our common wealth. That's what that's why we have a state. And communists, yeah, there are plenty of communists in this movement. But there are also a, across, across the political spectrum, we have liberals, we have ultra liberals trying to get basically income into effect. They hate the current welfare system and want to uh, get rid of that. Uh, we have the Ecological movement. It sees this as a way to, okay, maybe we can lessen demand. Maybe we can stop this vicious cycle of uh, having an annual increase in the domestic product. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, we have a fight. Uh, nearly all the pirate parties down in Europe are supporting this are putting this out to their members. Please sign this initiative, please talk about this paper. If I were part of Sweden, it's a bit more um, lukewarm. <laughs> Actually, they like the idea. Most of the board are on on it, but they, they're too afraid to talk about it. it, it just a comment. It's no more communism than having free health care is communism. It's no more communism than having free education is I think we're slowly running out of time because we want to have invite you as well. So I'm gonna skip, skip the Tesla frame and uh, just show you a little bit of this because this is fun. You think? <laughs> Hi, my name is Sophia Lewandowski. I'm a professional maker. <laughs> We're citizens are demanding okay. a crucial communists in, in Switzerland, the for the introduction of a guaranteed income for everyone. Okay. And I think that was roughly the idea to follow the story of his yeah. Peter Oliver's in Bern, where supporters of the basic income idea have gathered for a grand. What we're seeing here in Switzerland is a completely revolutionary outlook towards the social welfare system. What's being proposed by a group of Swiss citizens is a guaranteed minimum income. Now, what that would mean is that every citizen, whether working in whichever job or not at all, would receive a set amount of money. Now, in order to try and illustrate their point that Switzerland is such a wealthy country and it has a mountain of money that can be shared out around all of its citizens, what we're seeing right now happening, just over to my right, is <laughs> 15 tons of gold coins poured out onto the Parliament Square here. Uh, that's 400,000 Swiss francs worth of money. That's around 350,000 euro. Now, this new revolutionary plan, and as I say, has resulted in this output. Yeah, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> so that's a five cent, a Swiss uh, franc cent for every citizen in Switzerland. Uh, that they have collected has uh, got from the central bank and bought out. They, sho they shoveled it back in later on. Yeah. To illustrate, the, the money is there. Uh, and what they did, this is the viral part of it. This is why this can be done in the European Union as well in the next two months. They started a bunch of friends, there, I think there were eight in activist groups, 
about one and a half year ago, and they collected enough signatures, naturally, in Swiss, to force a referendum on the issue. And this is, for me, quite mind blowing. It's, it's the first time that the state will have the option to actually vote on this. So uh, now that it's in the Parliament, where they're actually going to be debating about how to put the question to the people and what, at what levels this will be suggested, but it will be put to a vote, and everyone in Swiss will, will be able to vote on this. So this is the European Initiative for Basic Income. And this is the address we're trying to get one million people to sign. This is the Swedish web page. And we thank you for your attention and open your the floor to questions and comments. <coughs> what do you think about that? Yes. Um, I still don't understand where the money comes from. Swedish examples, is that okay with your audience? Are you, yeah. Um, Sweden has uh, existing social transfers of about 500 trillion, oh sorry, billions, 500 billion Swedish kronos. That's just a number for you. If I say it is enough to give everyone, everyone, about 4,500 kroners each month. That's the base, that's our existing welfare state. Okay, we need more than that. You, you won't be able to survive on, on 4,500 kroners, so we need to add other things. Well, what about these actually 100,000 100, people working with giving people these benefits, or not giving them in many other cases, it's such a waste of time, both for the bureaucrats and the people sitting there. We're losing working hours all the time at every unemployment office, at the social uh, offices. So when you add, when you add, add in that factor, you get a bit higher. And then, yeah, we need new revenue as well. Most proposals are for like a social minimum, about, in Swedish terms, about 8,000, 9,000 kronas a month. It's nothing you can uh, really have to manage your expenses if you're going to live on only that. But it's a very good base that will, will let you get maybe a part-time job or work on creating a company or something like that. There's a lot of people living on far less than that that yeah. try to you know, work on their own companies. For example, freelancers, basically a lot of them live on less than that. So. And if you want to check the numbers on this, because this is not one proposal, and this initiative is not saying this, this is the way. There's different proposals, there's hundreds of proposals out there, from, and they're different. I mean, the pirates have one way of looking at it, the Green Party Air Sweden have another way, uh, the feminists have other proposals. So, but if you look at these resources, you will find your links to that. Those were some examples, and of course, there's, you can be creative when it comes to the economy of the society. Uh, many people are talking about, like, for example, taxations of monetary trade when you trade with large sums of money that you, you could attach and that that should go to, a, to the basic income, then, for example. There's many, many different ways to find the means necessary. We could easily see uh, before that our, that our common wealth is, is enough to do this. So, so the reason to, to do this campaign and make the European Commission investigate the matter is to just to find out what methods could we use in Sweden, what could be used in the other countries in the European Union. Yes? Mm -hmm. Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you succeed with this, uh, how can you uh, verify or how can I say, trust the result of the people evaluating this? Like, there, there should be a lot of people that don't want this to happen in the European Union, and especially people involved in the evaluation, or, I mean, 
what's the what's the idea there there or the strategy afterwards if you succeed? Very good question. Uh, I would say most of the I mean this is European Commission we're talking about. They are dead set against this. Uh, but actually this it's citizens initiative. It's not like a, a vast petition or just a name list. It's, it's something set in the EU Treaty of Lisbon that will force them to do parliamentary hearings in Strasbourg to make research into the subject. And I think there will be uh, a pressure and the scientists that will want to look at the data from different angles. There are studies of this, uh, mostly for industrial nations, it's mostly from the 70s in the US and Canada, they had an experiment running in one county for four years, and they got really interesting results that really they didn't expect. And then, uh, but it was shut down. What kind of results? Oh, uh, well, hospital visits dropped 8%. Oh. You, wouldn't want, you don't really see the connection at first, but what one, one uh, doctor put it very uh, eloquently, that's it. A lot of things we're treating here is poverty. <laughs> and yeah, divorce rates with that. What is that? Well, women gain more economic freedom. They got out of abusive relationships or relationships they didn't want to have. And in the 70s, this was a very bad thing. That was actually the Nixon administration was shut down. But nowadays, I would think that would almost be looked on as a uh, it's a good thing. People are more free to uh, make their own choices. Uh, I want to. Are you happy with that answer, or do you want more? How no, no. I, I, I didn't expect uh, a perfect answer. <laughs> I don't ask questions. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're moving on. What would you be able to do to inflation, though? Because you would be expanding the consumer base quite far. It's a very good cost. Uh, it's one of the things we could put next to the that communist line because uh, <laughs> that's a very common one. As long as you don't actually print more money or uh, start running the state on the deficit, uh, it's probably not a huge problem. It could cost a small, uh, it could cost inflation on, uh, like you say, the buying power yeah. uh, is increased. But you have to remember that this is mostly, as the slides on the show, it's mostly about wealth redistribution. So the buying power will come from something. It will come from companies, it will come from very rich people, or something similar. But economists agree that if you give poor people money, they will, they will spend more of it. Or less will go into savings and buying houses, they will more buy base stuff. So uh, there is a concern for that, but it's not like it's not like free money forever. No, no, I'm not saying, but the, the money in the 1% stays put generally, right? Is it yeah, not being well, consumed or circulated in the same way? Surely it's smarter people have thought about it. It's mostly <laughs> in the market. Yeah. Yes, I'm not giving my point of view on this. Um, I've been thinking about this uh, in concept, and I believe that. <clears throat> If people get more free time, if they have a stable income, without, you know, um, that we're talking about, they will have a lot more time to actually um, think. Like, you know, in the, I think in the beginning, we will be saying, well, you know, playing video games and not doing something creative at first, but as time goes, I think more and more people will uh, start their own projects, uh, start making new things. And in this way, I think our development will uh, increase a lot. Like, like the internet, the internet came and increased the speed of the development in our world a lot. And if we have something like this, I think we should increase a lot more again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Is it a question? Yeah, or think about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there. I, I could personally, I can see a lot of potential things that could happen uh, if we compare uh, what are the driving forces of innovation. We can see that like being left alone and to do whatever you want is uh, is one of the driving forces of innovation. 
and also looking in uh, looking at culture and arts. It's also necessary that you have freedom to whatever you want. So we're going to see more of those things, more of the more of the artists, more of the innovators. That's probably crucial. I think also in science, actually, because if you have money, you also have the ability to research something you wish to research.